All right, today I want to talk to you about restriction enzymes and gel electrophoresis. So let's start out. So restriction enzymes, right? So these are technically what we call endonucleases. So the prefix endo means within, and the nuclease is something that separates nucleotides. So what in restriction enzymes do is they cut. So very useful in biotechnology, being able to cut DNA at exact locations. And then I can insert them and make what's called recombinant DNA. So restriction enzymes originally discovered by scientists when looking at bacteria. So like bacteria infects you, the only thing small enough to infect bacteria is, is technically a virus. So this is a classic T4 phage. Right, so in the head you have the DNA, right? uh, you have the tail, um, and you have these, what they look like, uh, little feet, right, or long fibers. And what they do is they look for receptors on the surface. If you look at this electron micrograph here at the bottom, right, it's a bacilli. And all those little blue uh, things are T4 phages, and they found a specific surface protein, and they latch on, and they latch on to compress, and they inject the nucleic acid into the bacteria. That nucleic acid then finds a spot in the DNA and cuts it, right, inserts itself, and then it starts making virus. Right? So the T4 phase is named after the organism where it was discovered. So one of the most common ones we use is E. Cor 1, and it was discovered in E. coli, and the one means it was the first one they discovered. Another common one we use it's Hindi 2, right? It was um, discovered in the flu virus, right? So it's what flu virus uses to cut DNA. And it was the second one discovered in the flu virus. <clears throat> but that's, those are two probably the most common ones we use. All right. <clears throat> so how does it work? So restriction enzymes, these search for palindromes. So a palindrome is something that's the same frontwards and backwards. All right, so that's a palindrome sentence. All right, so the E. coli, right, will go ahead, or the E. coli 1, will go ahead and search for a place to cut. So if the example is if it cut between the M and the I, right, it would search a palindrome that would cut between where it is. But the palindrome has to be the same in the way, right? M A D A M, so there's Madam, Prime, Adam. So it's the same both forward or backwards. Right? So within your DNA there are the things called palindromes and it looks for them. Right, so um, this is Lambda DNA. We, we commonly use lambda DNA as a standard for number of cuts and number of size. So lambda uh, is a is a phage virus. Right? Right. So the lambda genome is forty eight five and it has a small plasma of about six thousand base pairs. So you can say that um, for a six bay pair enzyme, which is the most common size we use, right? But every three thousand base pairs, uh, there's a, a lambda insertion site, right? Or an insertion site. Uh, not important to remember, but if you look at um, this is gel electrophoresis when I talk about it. So a couple things about gels, right? So I load these are um, these things up top. These are called wells. Right, and that's where I put DNA. Right. So in the so this is I mean there's gonna be a 
roar. Right. This is uncut lambda, right, right here. Right, so that's lane two. Right. So lane three is cut with PST. Right. Lane four is cut with E4, one. And lane five is Hindi. So if you see that, um, each of these lanes is cut with a different restriction inside. And each of them gives you different type of band markers. So it cut a, a number of times. So if you look at this lane with a PST1, we got there's a faint band at the very bottom. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10 cuts. Right. If you look at E four one, I got one, two, three, four, five cuts. Right? Or actually it's one less. So I've got four cuts, I've got nine cuts. And then Hindi, right? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven fragments, so six cuts. Okay, so they're all gonna cut different because the palindromes are all unique. So restriction cuts. So they all look for palindromes. So the E core one palindrome So the E core one looks for G A A D C. Right? So it cuts between G and A. So if you look at over here, I've got the G A A T T C and it cuts between G and A. So remember it's going to cut there, it's going to cut there, then it's going to go ahead and cut across there like that. So it's going to make that cut, and then when it separates the DNA, I get what's called a 5' prime overhang. Right, so this is my 5' prime overhang right here. And these are called sticky ends. So the sticky end means if I have that overhang there, right, so if I have an overhang, if I can get a sticky end that matches it, right, remember that the DNA is stuck together by hydrogen bonds, and those are naturally occurring bonds. So if I get a similar sticky end, then it'll just kind of suck together and stick, right? So sticky ends are very useful um, for adding DNA to things, right? So PST1 cuts between the G and the A. Again, so it would cut right here, it would cut right there. We'll cut up. So if you look at these two, right, top to bottom, right, they're cutting in opposite directions. So the PST1 gives me a three prime overhang. Right? So this is a sticky end as well. If you look at uh, PVU2, right, cuts between the G and the C, and that's like this, and that creates a blunt end. Now, sticky ends are preferred to blunt ends because if I have a blunt end, right, then I could invert my DNA and stick it together upside down, and it would be not useful at all. So blunt ends are good for just cutting things, right? Blunt ends are great for cutting up DNA, looking at size, um, but it's not really good for, for insertion of genes, right, because there's too many pairs that could happen in the insertion. It could be backwards, it could be upside down. So make sure you, you understand um, how to cut. I'll try to find an activity for you. Um, and then insert. Alright, so restrict using restriction enzymes to clone genes of interest. Alright. So the reason why they're so important to us, especially in bacteria, and that's where we're going to concentrate um, what we do here a little bit is plasmids are those little pieces of DNA, right? And we make plasmids, we engineer plasmids. And so if I have a plasmid, a circular piece of DNA, within the plasmid, I'll have an ORI. Right? Remember that's our origin of replication. Right? Um, I'll have a promoter. Right? And the promoter tells um, tells where to start reading for a gene, right? And then 
will have um, restriction sites. So we'll have this area and we'll call it an MCS. Well, well MCS stands for multiple cloning site. So a multiple cloning site. And what this does is it contains many palindromes. So it contains many palindromes that restriction enzymes we use may, may recognize. Right? And then we'll have a terminator sequence over here. Right? Something that tells to stop reading a gene. Right? So I'll have something like that. There's other things that we'll talk about that are in plasmids. Right? But this is the important part. Alright, so using restriction sites, right, for enzymes to clone genes. So if I have my plasmid, um, if I have an E core one site, right, and I have another E core one site right here. Alright, so using E core one, that restriction enzyme will cut that plasmid. Right. If I have donor DNA, so this is my plasmid. This over here is my donor DNA. So my plasmid and my donor DNA should be cut with the same enzyme. Right. So if I cut my plasmid with E core one, I'd want to cut it with E core one. Then I'll get the same sticky enzyme. Right. So <coughs> when I mix my cut plasmid um, with my cut donor DNA, then it should uh, anneal, right? So this process in the middle is called annealing. And annealing is simply just sticking, right? So that's that process is called annealing. And then I get a recombinant plasmid, right? So recombinant plasmids are plasmids that have uh, DNA from two different organisms. All right, so the, the problem here, so if I get, so I'll get some errors, right, I'll get some errors. So what they call about mismatch here, so if I cut the plasmid with only E core 1, right, I can get two plasmids to come together because we'll have similar sticky ends. I can get two donor DNAs to come together because they have the same sticky ends, right? I could get my donor DNA inverted and put together because it has similar sticky ends. So oftentimes um, you have the best results if you cut your, your plasmid and your donor DNA with two separate restriction enzymes because that way the insertion can only be in a single direction, right? But whatever it is, you have to cut your plasmid and your donor DNA with the same, um, the same restriction enzymes. So restriction cuts are often singular. Right? Cuts may be selected upstream from a promoter. So this is called upstream. So if I have my promoter here, I have to swim upstream, right, to get to my cloning site. And that's because my RNA that reads this will hook on kind of like our RNA primer we talked about, in front of that promoter site and start moving in that direction. And then once I put it in, the ends are going to be tied with ligase. Remember? Because ligase makes it permanent. <coughs> so restriction enzymes, that's just an introduction. We'll talk more about restriction enzymes. Um, so strength is measured in U. Right? Uh, the important part here is I don't need you to memorize the, the normal strength. Uh, operating temperature for most is 37 degrees Celsius because um, we use E. coli a lot. E. coli is a human pathogen, so it's most active at about human temperature. So about 37 degrees. Uh, but, right, so enzymes are temperature sensitive, just like all proteins. So if I make them too cold, they wind up too tight. Or make it too hot to denature, right? But I want to store them cold. 
right? When I make them really cold, it deactivates them. Because I don't want restriction enzymes working, right? I just want them waiting. So we keep them on cold ice. Uh, if we would be using the restriction enzymes right now in the lab. And we would have them on ice until the very last moment when we use them. And then we would heat them up because as soon as they get with DNA, they start cutting, right? So it should only remove from cold long enough to handle. Right? So I should just be removing them, putting them with my DNA, mixing them, letting them work, and then deactivate them. All right. So we'll move on from there to gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis... So I can use gel electrophoresis to evaluate restriction cuts. All right, so um, there's a couple different types, but we'll start with horizontal gel electrophoresis. And so horizontal gels. So there's a couple things. So if I was going to put my horizontal gel setup, right, and if you were in my class, you've done this before. All right, so. Um, here I have a negative side and a positive side, right? And these are my <coughs> terminals, right? So like it says over here, this is my cathode. This is my anode. And here, so this is my buffer chamber. Within my buffer chamber, is my gel. This is my gel. Alright, so the buffer is an electrolyte, and an electrolyte conducts electricity. electricity. Alright, so the buffer will conduct electricity from the cathode to the anode. Right? I will put my DNA, so this right here is called a well. Right? And that's where I add DNA. So the well is where DNA is at, and the well is just a depression in the gel, right? So a couple things. So buffers are used as electrolytes. They conduct current, right? The agarose gel acts as a molecular sieve. A molecular sieve is simply just a filter. So agarose is a kind of flimsy um, substance. We'll make, when we get back, we'll make lots of gels, right? So I put my DNA that's been cut with restriction enzymes in the well, and current will come here. So remember that DNA is negatively charged, right? So it's important to remember that DNA Because uh, light charges repel. So that current will repel it in that direction. All right. So gel preparation, you'll be preparing gels when we get back. All right. So gels are heated. All right. So they come as uh, we, we have buffer. 
and then we have our gel, uh, which comes as a powder, and then we'll just heat it, right? And as we heat it, right, that powder dissolves in the gel. And when it gets clear, right, when it gets to boiling and it's clear and all that powder's been um, the dissolved will pour into a gel trays, right? And it's hard to explain without having all my stuff here, but um, that's what we'll do, right? Uh, and you guys will make your own gels. Right? When the gel is about 55 degrees Celsius, then you'll pour it. And the way we tell it's 55 is we hold the, the flask in our hand. When the flask is hot, right, but it's too hot, not too hot to hold, it's about ready to, to pour. And we'll explain a little bit more about that um, when we go. But if your gel is not done correctly, you get, these are called bands. You can see how the bands are all wavy, right? That's because the gel is, is inconsistent. Or if you get something like here, where it looks like it's got dots, right? that's because the gel wasn't melted and it's got crystal powder in there. Right? And I got more, like I got wonky gel or wonky bands that are pointing different ways. Again, right? so the top one uh, wasn't dissolved all the way. The bottom two right? Excuse me. are simply because uh, it was poured too slowly and it started to cool at different rates so you get clumping. But we'll deal with that. <clears throat> so gel buffers. Uh, the most two common buffers we use are TAE and TDE. Uh, we mostly just use TAE for this class. Right? Tris acetic acid. All right. So Tris is a buffer and acetic acid uh, moderates the pH. So remember buffers uh, moderate pH. Then EDTA, right, uh, is a chelating agent. So it says it right here. So what it does, it sticks to DNA, right, uh, helps it become linear, right. But what it does, it helps it from breaking down, right. So it stabilizes the DNA in its current state. So make sure you know that EDA is a chelating agent, and a chelating agent is something that uh, helps it re re resist degradation or coming apart. Right. All right. So agarose gel percentages. Um, the thing that you have to remember here. So lower percentages. So if we think about it, so if I have a low percentage, it's for large DNA, and if I have a high, because what it does is it increases the amount of obstruction or filtering into it, right? So uh, generally speaking, we'll use 0.7 to 1%. 1% is easiest to make, so we make 1%. Um, and that would be for an average size DNA strand, right? Greater than 1% is for smaller fragments. We'll make 3% gels for very small plasmids. Right. So molecular rulers, right, are used for base pair selection. So in almost every gel we do, right, we'll have a molecular ruler. And the molecular ruler, right, uh, have cuts of known size. have fragments of known size. And so those fragments um, will run that molecular ruler, you see that M here, right? And we'll have a digest, and that digest will tell us um, how many cuts there are, but also the size. Like if I look at this band right here, right, that's between 1,200 and 1,500, so I could estimate it at like 13.5 or something like that. Right, and this cut right here, 
right? I could say somewhere around 500 base pairs. <coughs> so that these are all in the base pair size. Okay. So, all right, so um, because DNA is clear, right, it needs to be stained. Uh, there are different types of stains. Um, there are positive stains. Right? Remember, DNA is negative, so a positive stain will stick to the negative DNA. Uh, we tend not to use positive stain. Um, they're fairly non-toxic. They're recommended for schools. Um, the number one positive stain is called fast blue or flash blue, uh, but it tends to make the gel blue and the DNA blue. So the smaller fragments are really hard to see. That's a professionally done one. Um, so obviously it's it's good, but really get bad results with it. Um, we have fluorescent dyes, right, which is added to DNA to allow. Um, as to see it with a uh, ultraviolet light, which we have in our class. Um, this is gel red. I like to use gel red, so in our class we use gel red a lot. <clears throat> so gel red will mix with the DNA before we run it in the gel, and afterwards we just show a uh, black light on it, and then it lights up all of our DNA strands. Right? Those are a lot of cuts. It's sounded really good. Um, this is gel green. I don't like gel green as much. And these are dyes that come from uh, fluorescent sea anemones and stuff like that. Our sea All right. The industry standard is ethidium bromide. All right, so this would be ethidium bromide stain. All right. Uh, it intercalates with DNA, so it gets into the middle of DNA and matches onto it. Uh, it's fairly toxic. All right. So because it's fairly toxic, we won't use it in school. I think the industry is going to kind of the gel red, gel green, uh, because it gives you similar results and it's not toxic. Right? I think the epitome of bromide has a longer shelf life though. So once I stain it, it stains forever. Now, something we can talk about is when we look at these gels, if I was going to evaluate the gels, remember over here in the first well, right? Over here in the first well, that's M, that's our molecular ruler. Then I have the cuts here, right? So the cuts, the, when we're evaluating cuts, Smaller fragments travel farther. So the, the smallest fragment would be right here, and the largest fragment would be right there. Okay? So the smaller fragment, fragments travel farther. So if I was using this to look at similarity, right, we would say that in lane 3, And then five would be the same individual if I'm looking at for similarity. <clears throat> the last thing, so what do we use? So gel is used So we use it for forensics, paternity, we can use it for um, DNA barcoding, uh, checking Right. So we can use it for all those things. Okay, so 
Um, one of the first methods in forensics that we had was Southern blot analysis. So I put on there that Southern blot analysis was kind of one of the first. So it looks like what are called RFLPs. And those are re restriction fragment length polymorphisms. So within your genome, you have these, these uh, repeating patterns, right? Um, and those are called polymorphisms. And those are in what are, we call NTR regions, or non-translated regions. And they're common and they're inherited within families. So we used to be, we used to look at um, these RFLPs to look at similarity or so uh, when I do this, this is called DNA fingerprinting. So that's called DNA fingerprinting. So we used to look at RFLPs. Uh, in RFLPs, this is called southern blotting. This should be OU. Southern blotting, right? It shouldn't be southern, it should be southern, right? Because it's named after a guy named Edward Southern who developed it. So we looked at restriction length polymorphisms. So essentially what we did, we got, if we went to a crime scene, right, we would get DNA from the crime scene, we'd cut it with restriction enzymes, then we'd get suspects, and we cut their DNA with the same restriction enzymes. And then we would run their stuff on a gel, right? I'd use so we use restriction enzymes, we run it on a gel, we use fluorescent probes and markers, and we eventually um, get an analysis. And you can see that this individual and that individual have the same RFLPs, right? So obviously they're, they're, they're the same. All right, so um, that's it for today, and uh, I will talk to you soon.